Hello, welcome again for another talk. And today we are discussing traumatic arrest, its perks, its dogmas, and a lot of stuff. Or is it so? Isn't just cardiac arrest in trauma meaning death? And that's the end of this today's class. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, is it so? I don't think so. So, what we have seen recently is that a lot of people have been getting good results in reanimating cardiac arrest with good neurologic outcomes. That's something that matters a lot to us. So, this dogma that uh, cardiac arrest means death or like really poor neurologic outcomes isn't true anymore. This doesn't hold anymore. So, what can we do with a traumatic arrest? CPR for everyone? What do you think? Maybe should we be doing CPR? And who should we do, be doing CPR on? So, firstly, we have to ask ourselves, why did this patient arrest? We have a trauma patient that his heart's not beating, he has no pulse. Why is that? We have to go back to the 5H, 5T from ACLS and the reversible causes of arrest and think about what may be the cause in this patient. So hypoxia, yeah, we have to think about hypoxia in these patients. Uh, we have the, the tongue, we have blood, we have a vomit and what or not, and the patient may have his, his breathing impaired. So this may be the, the cause of the arrest in this specific patient. Hypovolemia, of course, it's the main reason that these patients arrest is because they, they lose acutely, they lose blood, and if you don't have enough volume to for your heart to beat, to pump, you just arrest. Acidosis, yeah, yeah it, it, we have acidosis in these patients, but usually it's not the cause of the rest. Yeah, it's associated, we have it, we, but uh, it's not why they arrested. The same holds for hypothermia. Yes, we are losing heat. We don't have uh, the regulatory mechanisms. So yeah, they have hypothermia, but it's usually not why they arrested. Unless like you have a someone that fell in the middle of uh, the middle of the woods and was rescued a couple of days later. But usually our EMS is quite good that these patients come to the hospital quite fast. It's not enough time for the, them to arrest because of the hypothermia. Yes, we have to take care. Yes, they are a uh, hypothermia is on the uh, lethal triangle or the lethal diamond. So yeah, we have to take care, but usually it's not why they arrested. The same holds for hypo and hyper K. So potassium, Yes, if you have like a, a bad trauma, you have muscle, musculoskeletal lesions, you have potassium overflowing in your, in your, your blood, and this may cause arrhythmia. But more often than not, this is not why they arrested in, in the trauma. But yeah, we have to look for it. So PE, pulmonary embolism. Uh, not really, it's not really the, the cause of a traumatic arrest. The same goes for thrombosis of the heart. Uh, sorry about that. So yeah, cardiac uh, infarction may be associated. Again, if you have a traumatic patient that is arrested and the, the, the cinematic doesn't match the, the gravity of the patient. So you have like Cardiac arrest in a very mild, very soft trauma, perhaps the trauma is not the cause. Perhaps they had an MI and that's why they had the trauma. So we may think of that, but usually it's not the cause of the, the cardiac arrest in a trauma patient. Cardiac tamponade, yeah, this may be present in trauma. This may, may be why they, their heart is not pumping. The same holds for tension pneumothorax. It's a very common cause of cardiac arrest and trauma. 
And for toxics, yeah, they may be associated, but usually they are not the cause why they are arrested in a trauma. So we would have these main four entities, hypoxia, hypovolemia, cardiac tamponade, and tension pneumothorax. So what do we do? Do we go for CAB like ACLS, ABCD like ATLS, XABCD like PHTLS, or just get out of here and call for help? What should we do? If you're thinking about doing your regular standard ACLS in this trauma patient, doing the chest compressions, we have to think, why are we doing chest compressions? I'm try trying to squeeze the heart so it pumps the, the blood forward, right? But if I'm thinking about hypoxia, yeah, probably the problem is not the heart. So we have to ventilate this patient so we can make this blood, blood oxygenated blood flow. If we are thinking about hypovolemia, it doesn't matter. If you don't have uh, enough preload, you don't have enough circulating volume, it doesn't matter. If I just do chest compressions, it's not enough to make the, the blood flow. So it's pretty much not very useful in these cases. Also for tension pneumothorax and cardiac tamponade, you have extrinsic overpressure that doesn't make, doesn't allow the, the heart to pump. So you are squeezing your heart and you don't also don't have preload. So you can't pump this. So uh, cardiac compressions, thorax, thorax compressions won't work very well either. So just doing your standard vanilla CPR probably won't be enough for these patients. So we stay with XABCD or ABCD. So, okay, if I'm an ambulance, if I'm out of the hospital, I'm thinking about exsanguination. If I'm in the hospital, I don't think about exsanguination. Is that so? I don't like to think about that. If you receive a patient like this in your ER, uh, he's bleeding, you have to control the bleed, you know? Uh, we have to stop the bleeding because every blood cell in this patient is important. They are already at loss, they are already in a deficit. If you are still losing blood, it's not gonna get better. So even if I'm in ER, I started with X, I started controlling external hemorrhage, and and even if the I'm receiving an ambo crew that already has some bleeding control in, I have to check because uh, they came uh, lights and sirens. The patient is moving from one stretcher to another. The, they may lose the tourniquet. It may dislodge. So I always think about the X when I'm seeing the, these patients. So if they you don't have in place. You have to do bleeding control, either with a regular standard tourniquet or improvised one if you don't have. It's not ideal, but we have to. Also, uh, we are thinking that pelvic trauma may be a source of bleed. So just putting a sheet or a pelvic binder is a very easy, straightforward, uh, fast thing to do. And it has like no really bad size for it. You know, you are not, if you don't have a, a lesion, you are not causing one just for putting a sheet on this patient. Otherwise, on the other hand, if you have uh, internal bleed and you don't do this and the patient is in a cardiac arrest, it doesn't matter how much volume you give this patient, he's still losing it. So we have to take care of the bleeding control in these patients before moving. And we have to fill the tank. Hypovolemia is the main cause of cardiac arrest in these trauma patients. So we need to give them, them blood. Oh, I don't have blood in my hospital or in my ambo. What can I do? Can I use crystalloids? Yeah, you're not doing the best for your patient, but you need a minimum preload so the, the heart can beat. So yeah, you may use, but knowing that you're not doing the best. These patients need hemo products. They need blood, they need platelets, they need coagulation factors. And so we need to fill the tank with 
what they lost. And we need to intervene in this airway more aggressively. Uh, usually we go straight for ETTs. You need to intubate this patient because we need to have this airway in hand for what we are going to see next. That's the briefing. We, ha we may have tension between the thorax and should we do needle decompression in these patients? It's a traumatic cardiac arrest. If you are thinking about a tension pneumothorax, it's a big one. Uh, perhaps just a needle won't be enough, won't be fast enough uh, to release all this pressure to make the, the heart beat again. You, we may have hemothorax associated, so perhaps for these patients, just a needle decompression is not enough. So what's our alternative? The finger thorax to me. We get a fourth or fifth uh, ICS, um, axillary midline, get a scalpel, open the skin, finger in, reach the pleural space, and make a hole in it. So if you have air or blood, it will release the pressure and hopefully make the heart be able to, to pump again. So just stick a finger in the chest of the patient in one or both sides depends on what you are doing what are how are you diagnosticating this patient what is the problem now you have two holes in the chest of this patient and we know that the ventil ventilatory mechanics when you are inspirating your thorax is uh, increasing the volume and pressure uh, intrathoracic pressure is reducing so the air can can come in but if you have an open chest wound so that you just done the air will search for the path of least resistance in this case instead of coming from the trachea it will just go through the holes so you don't have a ventilation of the lungs which is really bad that's why we tend to be more aggressive on intubating the these patients so now i can do uh, positive pressure ventilation and I can just oxygenate these lungs so that's why we intubate first another cause is the cardiac tamponade so if you're thinking about trauma this is a very acute tamponade and what's the liquid what is in the the sac it's blood and this blood has to come from the the pericardial sac from it, within it so we have either blood coming from the heart or from the great vessels, so like an aortic, a pulmonary lesion that is oozing blood in this um, in this sac that's not uh, can't expand, so it will just contract the the heart. And what should we do? Should we do pericardiosynthesis? Get your marfan puncture. Just get some blood out yeah again you are releasing the pressure from the heart but you are not uh, treating the cause it is a bridge until you can do proper treatment you may do it but you may waste time so usually what's indicated in these patients that have a cardiac arrest and you are thinking about a cardiac tamponade you should do the resuscitative, resuscitative thoracotomy or ER thoracotomy. So you just open the, the ribs, get the pericardium, open it and find where the blood is coming from and fix it. Here you can see the, they put a folly in the, in the heart, plug the hole until you can stitch it. So you are actively controlling the cause of the cardiac tamponade. Also, Another, a cause of hypovolemia is the intraabdominal bleed. And again, it, it, I can't just give blood products and try to fill the tank if I still have the hole in. The, the blood is just being lost. So we tend to talk about damage control surgery. This is the kind of patient that is in a cardiac arrest. I can't take him to the ER. I can do like a, a very long surgery. This is where the trauma surgeon will intervene and sometimes if you have the resources, the capacity of it, 
on the ER, you will do this kind of surgery. Just open the belly, pack it, find some bleed you can control. If you can't, just close it and try to to control the, this bleed as much as you can, so you can resuscitate this patient adequately. Okay, yeah, that was very nice, but how do I diagnosticate these, these things? How do I know if he has some bleed, some pneumothorax, some tamponade? How is it? Is it easy to do this with just a stethoscope? Yeah, not really. We need uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound is our friend in these cases. And if you haven't heard about, uh, if you haven't seen the, the lecture on, on ultrasound in trauma, check the card and we have uh, another class on it. So that goes a little bit deeper, but we'll talk uh, about what uh, we can see here. So here we have the, the barcode sign that's very indicative of pneumothorax. Here we have the, the lung point. So we have the um, pleural sliding here, the lung sliding, and here it's stopped. We don't see it moving. That's because we have the air between the pleuris. Also, you have to make sure you're ventilating this patient because if you are not ventilating it, there will be no lung sliding. Uh, we may see the hemothorax. So here we are uh, seeing the, the liver, the diaphragm, and the collapsed lung. So we are here in the hepatorenal space. And all this black stuff here in the context of a trauma patient is blood. So we have a large hemothorax that may be the cause of this cardiac arrest. Also here we have two windows uh, of the heart. Here is the four chamber apical view. Here is the parasternal lung, ac uh, lung axis. And in both, we can see that the, the heart is just in the middle of a, a lot of free fluid. So this is a cardiac tamponade. It's not pumping very well. Here we have the right ventricle not um, dilating enough. So the, we have a a heart that's trying very hard to, to pump, but if we have a cardiac arrest, this probably is the cause. For intra-abdominal bleeding, uh, we again can use the ultrasound. Here we see free fluid uh, and uh, we can see the, the liver. We can see here the, the bladder and some free fluid uh, around it. Here we have the spleen, free fluid. So all this makes us think about hypovolemia from some intra-abdominal bleeding. But there's, okay, that's good, but we should consider some other things before uh, our attempts to resuscitate these patients. How long has been this patient arrested? So the EMS found this patient already in a cardiac arrest or he had vitals and when he was arriving in the yard, he arrested. This kind of stuff will make us think uh, about how much can we try and uh, how probably how good is the prognosis of this patient. And mainly, what are the resources that I have? Uh, am I in a rural ED that I don't have surgery? I don't have a blood bank. Uh, what can I do? Can I really adequately, adequately resuscitate this patient? Maybe not. Uh, what can I do? How can I transfer this patient? Or do I have, am I in a trauma center that I have all I need here in the ER? So this will make us balance um, what we can do, what we can't, what we should. And these are things we have to have in the back of our minds. And just to sum up a little case I, I had, so I was on on Hems, we came with the helicopter, uh, a motorcycle crash, the patient was arrested upon arrival, but we already had a BLS crew doing CPR in the middle of the street. Uh, it was a, a scene with a lot of people around, it would be... Uh, you know, the TV on, that kind of stuff, every, everybody taping. It's a bit hard just to uh, 
uh, arrive and say, hey, don't do anything. Let's just stop. Let's just call it. So we have to, to check for what we can do, what are the causes that we can create on the scene. So the patient was in asystole upon arrival, which is not a great sign because all these causes, if you're thinking about hypoxia, hypovolemia, uh, tamponade, uh, pneumothorax, usually you have PEA, you, your, your heart, the, the electric part of the heart is still working, but the mechanic part that is not working very well, either because you don't have fluid or because you don't have space for it to pump. So PEA tend to be better than a systole. What we could do in the scene is bilateral finger thoracostomy and there was no air escape and no blood escape, which also is not a very good sign for this patient in the middle of the road, because if we had the release of air, it would be okay that his arrest might have been because of a uh, tension pneumothorax that's solved now, but that was not the case. So we used Bocus to see the heart and we had the standstill heart, meaning that you had no myocardial, myocardial uh, function, no contractility, and again, a sign of bad prognosis. So with all that, I wouldn't have anything else that I could offer for this patient. If you're thinking about hypovolemia, I didn't have external bleed, I didn't have a pelvic fracture, anything that I could fix on scene. Uh, I couldn't do damage control surgery in the middle of the road, uh, especially with, also I'm not a surgeon, so yeah, we couldn't uh, treat the probable cause of this arrest. So we had to call it. Unfortunately, that's still not unusual having to, we lose these patients that are in a cardiac arrest because we don't have, uh, the means to treat the cause of the arrest. And that was what I had for you today. Any questions, hit on the, the comments. I'll link the, the articles, the, the papers that were on, on this class. And if you want to chat, just hit me up on Instagram and see you next time.